Rain day. Yeah, Monday was a rough, rough rain day, wasn't it? Stormed all morning, like early in the morning hours. It was a rough storm. Mercy woke up. She got scared in the middle of the night. It's pretty rough. Yep. Yeah, it is really. Before you got there? Yeah. How you doing? Working? Miracle. All right. Anyway, well, listen, we're going to do an event uh, before we get started with the message here. We're going to do an event on Saturday, Lord willing. It's called Praise the Loud. It's at the Basilica. Uh, that big that big monstrosity on top of the, the biggest high place in the cities. Right? And they're having a block party. It's called Praise the Loud. And they're going to have a bunch of bands in there. And they're going to be Basic, we're going to bring the half mile hailer, by the way. We're going to bring that. Yeah, we need to have that with us. So, because I think we're going to be able to use it fine in there. So, around there, it should be okay. We'll see. We'll try. That's all we can do, right? But anyway, um, we will, uh, I think it'll be in the afternoon. So, they're supposed to rain. So, it's going to be, so bring some of those uh, ponchos, you know, those rain, rain, uh, things or whatever, bring some of those with you just to, to make sure that you're, you know, you've got one just in case it rains on us for a little while. It's supposed to like rain till the afternoon and then like start again later in the evening. So I don't know how it's going to work, but you know, I don't know how bad it's supposed to rain, but we'll see, but we'll bring some rain gear just in case and hit it anyway and just see what happens. Uh, but um, should be a pretty, it's going to be a huge event for this week. So um or for the summer, it's one of the biggest ones, I guess. So uh, we need to be preaching outside of that for sure and uh, try to warn all those sinners up there of their impending doom. Amen. And uh, so there's, there's going to be, there's going to be thousands of people there. It's one thing nice about being so close to the, to the Twin Cities that there's always these huge events where you can go. You know what I mean? You can talk to a lot of people. And you can preach to a lot of people. You preach to thousands of people at these big events. And there's so many of them. Like every week, there's something different during the summertime, too. So it's kind of nice that we have that many events to go to. And there'll be more coming. I mean, there's a lot of them coming here. So we want to get to as many as we can every weekend if we can. And, and this one will be a later one, so we'll be into the evening. Okay, uh, not too late, but it'll be late enough. Um, and, uh, you know, so it should be should be pretty pretty good, though. It should be be a pretty uh, pretty productive event there. Uh, there's a, there's a few public streets uh, that are there that 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 is not rented out by the basilica or whatever. So there's a few of those there that we're going to be able to get to like right outside of the event, I think, or something. We're really just going to have to be there to figure out where we can be, and we'll try a few different things like we normally do and see what happens. But but uh, there, I know for sure there's they, Brother Miller told me there was a few uh, a few of the the streets there are just perfectly public and they're fine and we won't have any problem with them. So. That's what we're going to try to do, okay? Uh, so let's, we'll meet here. I'm guessing we'll meet here or at my house, whichever. Uh, I think we should probably do that around, I'm thinking around 2 3 o'clock, okay? But I'll, I'll see. Let me do some more checking and I'll text everybody to make sure. But that sounds like it should work because the event doesn't really get kicked in until like 4 30 to where they're all really there. You know what I mean? Where people are ro roaming around and all this stuff's going on. So I want to kind of get there. You know, so we're there an hour before all that. So we'll see. Let me let me do some digging around and make sure, kind of take a, a look at the event and everything and see. But I think that's probably a good time in the afternoon. And then we'll be out we'll be out pretty late. You know, we'll stay as long as our voices hold out. And if we're using the hailer, that might be longer. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, you know, anyway, we'll we'll try that to see what happens. But um, and uh, anyway, this weekend though, this weekend we're going to do a baptism. Allie's going to be baptized this weekend. Uh, but also in the afternoon, I want to have a street preachers meeting. Okay, I want to get together over here with the men, and we're going to have a meeting uh, and just talk about some things, and uh, like we should be doing, like every month if we can. So I'm going to go over a few things and talk about some stuff because we got a lot of events coming up and everything, and want to make sure that we're 
we're working together as a body and doing things the way the Lord wants us to do and everything and encouraging one another and, you know, talking things, talking about things and everything like that too. So we want to do that together and pray together as men. We got to be over there praying together. Amen. We need to pray together and ask the Lord to bless us as we do the, do his work. Amen. Because we need the power of God to do his work. And, um, so anyway, so you pray about that, and, and we'll do that. And then right after that meeting, we'll head out to the, to the lake, and, and uh, we'll baptize uh, Allie out there. So, um, but anyway, right after lunch, we'll have that meeting. So, uh, so that should be good. But anyway, uh, interesting, interesting uh, summer we have here. So lot, lots of good stuff going on here. So you pray for one another, and, and uh, pray the Lord will bless our work that we do for him, and that he'd be honored and glorified by everything that we do. Uh, I pray for, again, for Brother Russ. Brother Russ is going to try to be there, so he's going to meet us over there. Lord willing, he's trying to work everything. He said he should be able to be there. So, Brother Lee, you're taking off Friday, right? Yeah. You'll, be, you'll be leaving Friday morning, sometime early morning. So taking off, and then, um, and then you, you won't be back until late. Yeah, yeah, whatever. But you'll be back by Sunday, though, Saturday sometime. Okay, yeah, good, so. So anyway, so pray for them. They're going on a little short trip to Milwaukee, is it? Yep. Okay, good. So what's it? Yeah, to make sure it's the right vehicle he wants to buy. So tell you that guy's fussy, all right? See? <laughs> you might as well have it done right, right? Amen. I agree with you. So um, you just take, if you're going to go buy something, you just take that critical eye Lee with you, man. He'll find it. If you want to find a fault in something, he'll find it. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. He will. <laughs> That's good. That's not a bad thing. You know, it's good, especially, you know, you buy something you want it to work right. So anyway, so you pray for them. They're going to take a little trip up there and or over to Milwaukee and, and pray for them that they have safety as they travel and everything like that. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we're supposed to pray for. Well, Nate made it. There he is. You didn't speed, did you, Nate? Yeah. No, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> I was telling you, I told you what happened to me, though. Up there when I was taking data, that eye appointment, I wasn't even paying attention. I didn't even know I was speeding. I really didn't. Because the, 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 the speed limit changes so fast right there when you're coming out of that, you know, on the, on the inter uh, Minneapolis, when, you come, when you're shooting down there, how it goes like, you know, it, it goes from 55, and then, it, you know, they got me for crossing over or whatever. The lady, the lady that pulled me over, she was very nice, though, because I didn't, I really wasn't, like, trying to speed or anything. I just didn't realize I was going that fast right there where you, where you turn in, and I just didn't pay attention, you know, what I was doing. I told her, so I was honest with her. I told her I didn't, wasn't paying attention. She let me out all three of them, though. She gave me, like, three tickets or something, and she gave me three warnings for everything. I don't even remember what they were. But uh, I was just thanking God that she did. That's all. <laughs> was it cross the line? And speeding was one, yeah. Did she give me a breathalyzer? No. No, she could tell that I... It's a real weird spot up there when you come out of the cities, when you're coming out of... Um, no, going out, going back out towards uh, 62 West. In that area where everything exchanges and they got that big circle there now and all that stuff is all like if you if you don't pay attention the signs used to be where you would go this way for it and they changed everything right there like the whole thing is just is just twisted up and different than it was before because i've drove that for like a long time but they changed it all in there it's different now it's not like they put that overpass in there and they changed all that uh 60 it's just not it's not the same as it used to be there the way that they i don't know what they changed there but they changed something and what's that yeah, because they're used to the old way of doing it. You don't know the old way, right? But the old, yeah, it, it's different. It's different than the way I used to drive it. And man, I just she got. I felt bad because I really, I don't really speed. I go, I go pretty slow. <laughs> you know, I go the speed limit. People get on me because I do, but I, I, I try not to speed. But it was just, man, it was bad. But anyway, I praise the Lord. She let me out of it. But she was, she was kind to do that. But. Uh, the Lord showed His grace there that day. That was something. Anyway, all right. Well, listen, we're going to talk about something here. Liquor, the lethal cocktail. Uh, actually, the lethal liquid. Brother Aaron it revised it for me. Anyway, the, the, the lethal liquid that leads to suicide. I want to talk to you about suicide and liquor. 
tonight. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you're not taking my titles. You're not taking my titles, Lee. Or I'm adding Lee. Or I'm adding Lee to that. Lee, one of the L's to one of the L's on that sermon. I'm just kidding. Anyway, what's that? Not nah, Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, turn to Proverbs chapter 23, please, if you would. And uh, I've preached on alcohol before, and and liquor, and drinking, and everything, and drunkenness, and all that. Um, this will go under that suicide series here, and I don't know if you have those all underneath there, but all the ones like psychotropic suicide, all those should be under suicide. I think I put them under there. I put originally on one of them, but I don't know if I told you to add that. If you would, please just put all those into one category so people can find those very easy when they're looking for them because it's important that they do uh, when people are looking under this topic uh, of suicide. And I'm telling you, uh, liquor drinking and suicide, it's rarely separated, folks. It's rarely separated. You'd be shocked at how many people, and I'm going to show you a lot of statistics. I have a lot of those for you tonight, and I just ask you to bear with me as I go through these, okay, because they're very important. I'm trying to put in perspective so people understand exactly what this leads to, exactly what liquor drinking leads to. And uh, let's read some of these verses, and we'll get right into it and pray. Uh, who hath woe, verse number 29, who hath sorrow? Now pay attention to these words, because they're very important. Each one, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, pay attention to that word sorrow, it's important. Who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed, seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like, an, like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It biteth like a serpent. Sure does, doesn't it? And stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes, now boy, I'll tell you what, nobody, you, if you've ever been a drinker before, if you've ever done any of that drinking before or anything like that, one thing that you can say, one thing that you can say is this is true. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. It's one of the problems with liquor drinking. And thine heart shall utter perverse things. You ever met drunks before? Sure you have. They got a perverse mouth. They speak perversely. Perverted. Their eyes behold strange women. Women that they don't know, women that, that are unfamiliar with them, they treat them in a different way and they utter perverse things about them. Why? Because of liquor. I'm so, you got preachers out there that are trying to tell people it's okay to casually drink. These are Baptist preachers out there. Tell people it's okay to casually drink. You're nuts. You're kidding me. You're telling me it's okay to play with a serpent? That's right. It says here, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me. Hmm. They. They have stricken me. Well, you can use that. That they could be one. That they could be a few things. That they could be people. That they could be devils. Real easy. When you start talking about a serpent, mm -hmm. you talk about a bunch of demon possessed living. You just a devil possessed living. You just look at people that are drinkers. You get devils all over you drinking booze, folks. Mm -hmm. That's right, drinking spirits. That's right. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. 
They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You know, I, that sums up just about everything, but you know what the problem is? The Bible is, sums up everything so easily. But I, and I'm going to take and show you a lot of things in history, and, 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 in um, uh, statistics, medically speaking, everything. The Bible just gave us, that's enough right there for us just to say, hey, who hath woe, who hath sorrow? Man, I'll tell you what, if, you got, if you're already sorrowful, if you already have some depression in your mind, you already have some of those things, you're, you already listen to the wrong wicked music, and you add liquor to that, I'm telling you what, you're close to death right there. Let's pray. Father, Lord, help us. We need you, Lord. We need the power of God. Lord, we need the understanding of the Holy Ghost. Illuminate us to this truth, Lord. Lord, there's people out there that are dying. There's people out there going to take their life, Lord, because they're on liquor tonight. And they're drinking booze and they have a sorrowful heart, they're going through depression, or some of the worst things in their life. And Lord God, I just pray that you'd speak to hearts here and wherever this message goes, Lord, that it would sink down deep. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This liquor leads to death. It leads to suicide. That's what it does. We've looked at suicide for the last couple weeks. By the way, suicide's not going away anytime soon. It's, it's not. We looked at psychotropics and suicide, how medicine affects that, how drugs affect it. The evidence is unavoidable that psychotropics or antidepressant drugs cause suicide. We also looked at musical suicide and how music has the power of influence. It can lead to suicide in already depressed people. Now we look at the most popular legal, lethal, socially acceptable drug on the market today that leads to suicide, that'd be liquor. It's one of the most lethal drugs out there. Why? Because it's socially acceptable. It's socially acceptable with, with the world, and now it's acceptable with the church. You know, the churches would look down on somebody that was, most of the churches would look down on somebody that was snorting cocaine or, or if they were smoking pot or something like that, they'd call them a dirt bag, right? But if they were drinking booze, well, I mean, it's not that bad, is it? It's not that big of a deal, is it? Not today. Yeah, just don't drink and drive, right? It is that bad today. It leads to death. It leads to suicide. Depression. You know, that's something that those dark things we don't like to talk about. Those dark things in this world that we don't want to talk about. We don't like to talk about death, really. We don't like to talk about, but, it, but, but the thoughts that people have had in their hearts about killing themselves, and, and, and you add liquor on top of that, and you got some trouble there. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to show you why. First, some statistics about that wicked liquid. How can alcohol be blamed for 100,000 deaths each year? Well, let's look at it. 5% of all deaths from diseases or, or of the circulatory system are attributed to alcohol. 5%. 15% of all deaths from diseases of the, of the respiratory system are attributed to alcohol. 30% of all deaths from accidents caused by fire and flames are attributed to alcohol. But go ahead, yeah, it's okay to have a beer. It's okay to have a few, right? It's okay to have one. It's no big deal. You could drink a little bit, right? Boy, these numbers aren't looking very good, are they? Now listen to this. 30% of all accidental drownings are attributed to alcohol. How about this one? 30% of all suicides are attributed to alcohol. 30% of all suicides. Because I'm going to tell you what, folks. You're looking at something. Now, I never, I never really wanted to do myself in, but I wanted to die a few times in my life when I was a lost man. And I remember when I was depressed over something traumatic that happened in my life. And the first thing I did when I was a lost man was run to the gas station and grab a bottle. And I took it home and I sat in my car and I drank it and I drank it and I drank it. And all I did was get more depressed. Why? Because the Bible says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow? They that tarry long, right? 
Look, folks, alcohol doesn't make you feel better. Initially, there's a high that comes with it. But after that high is over, you feel worse. And you're capable of doing worse things than you've ever... And on it, you're capable of doing anything. And I'll show you why in a little while. 40% of all deaths due to accidental falls are attributed to alcohol. 45% of all deaths in an automobile accident are attributed to alcohol. How about this one? 60% of all homicides are attributed to alcohol. Oh, I'd never do anything like that. You get yourself drunk enough, friend, you know what you're going to do. And by the way, after you have that initial one, you know your inhibitions are gone. We're going to talk about that. But they're gone, and those barriers that you held up were gone, so you don't know what you're capable of doing as you continue to drink it. Because you're not thinking in your right mind after one any longer. Why? Because you're loosened up. How do you know that, preacher? Because <laughs> I've drank, that's why. And you're loosened up. Oh, I, my judgment's not that impaired. Yeah. It's like, it's like seeing you grab a cobra in your hand, right? And playing with it and being like, it's cool. Or handing your little baby a cobra to play with in their hands. It, well, she's got the judgment to understand what to do with that cobra. She doesn't have discernment and judgment. Neither do you when you're drinking. Not at all. Terry Watkins in his, in his article about alcohol says this, there are over 18 million alcoholics in America. Now, I don't like that term. I call them drunks. They're not alcoholics. They're drunks. They're dirty, rotten drunks. Life-wasting, life-stealing drunks. It's not a disease. It's sin. Well, anyway, let's see here. Cirrhosis of the liver kills over 30,000 each year and rising. 50% of the people on welfare are due to killer alcohol. 80% of all fire deaths are due to, due, due to killer alcohol. Now, some of these numbers are, are different between who's doing the, the, um, the statistics and where they're doing them, because each part of the country is different, obviously. 65% of drownings, we heard this, 22% of home accidents, 77% of falls, 36% of pedestrian accidents, 65% of all murders. That's about accurate from what the other man said. 40% of all assaults, well, you, you understand that, right? You go out street preaching, right? You understand that, remember, remember, remember that drunk guy that always comes up and he's always in your face and, right? Well, he's always braver than what he should be. Well, what's making him so brave? Actually, what's making him so stupid? Alcohol. Beer muscles, that's right. How about this one? 35% of all rapes. 35% of all rapes. See, I wouldn't do that. You get yourself drunk enough, you don't know what you're capable of. A lot of people wouldn't do a lot of things if they were sober. By the way, that's why God tells His people eight times in the New Testament, be sober. You're the new man. Be sober. And then again, 30% of, other, of all other sex crimes and 30% of all suicides. Over 80% of all arrests are linked to alcohol. Makes sense. What do you think? A lot, most domestic disputes, somebody's drunk. When a cop shows up, somebody's drunk. Or both are drunk. And you got Christians today telling people it's okay to casually drink liquor. Mm. What planet do these people come from? Why would you tempt a man to drink booze in the first place moderately? Why would you do that? There's a wise statement here written by John G. Patton. He was a missionary in 1891. He said this, from observation at an early age, 
I became convinced that mere temperance societies were a failure and that total abstinence by the grace of God was the only sure preventative as well as remedy. What was temperance in one man was drunkenness in another. Everybody's different. Everybody is different. Man, there's some people that can take like drink like that much liquor and they are gone, wiped out, wasted. There's some that can drink more, can hold more. They're still drunk. And their judgment is still impaired, but they can drink more without losing it completely right away. And all drunkards came, not from those who practiced total abstinence, but from those who practiced or tried to practice temperance. I had seen temperance men drinking wine in the presence of others who drank to excess and never could see how they felt themselves clear of blame. And I have known ministers and others, once strong temperance advocates, fall through this so-called moderation and become drunkards. I, therefore, it has all my life appeared to me beyond dispute in reference to intoxicants of every kind that the only rational temperance is total abstinence from them as beverages and the use of them exclusively as drugs and then only with extreme caution as they are deceptive poisons of the most debasing and demoralizing kind. Let's have a truth. They used it for medicine. We understand that. But you know, too much medicine is poison. Right? The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Think about it. It's a mocker. And people are deceived by it. It does make you look like a fool, that's right. You act like a fool, you are a fool, that's why. David Cloud tells this story, I thought it was interesting. He said, my maternal grandfather came from a long line of drunks, and before my godly grandmother married him, she made him promise that he would never touch a drop of liquor. And that is a promise which he made. But one day he and another carpenter were working on a house, and the other fellow talked my grandfather into having just a sip to cool the tongue. They both got roaring drunk and ended up in jail. And my granddad was a deacon in a Baptist church. He was deeply repentant and was restored and never drank another drop as far as anyone knows. But it was a powerful reminder to him that wine is a mocker. Oh, it's just one to make me feel. I, I knew a lady once that used to, she used to come to church here. And, and she, said, she said, you know, I just have one glass of wine every week. And I, I have it just on like a certain day, you know, and it helps me just, it helps me to wind down and to calm down. Well, what, she, what was she saying to me? By the way, she left like soon after she got here. But what she was telling you is she liked the feeling that it made her, it gave her, right? She, what's, she was a moderate drunk, that's right. Just a little bit. She could, she was, oh, I just drink, you know, I just drink it once in a while. It's no big deal. She was an older lady. It just drank, it's no big deal. I just moderately drank it. One day she came over to my house. I'm going to tell you what, I think she was south when she came over. And, I, and she came over on the same day that she said that she drank it. And the reason, now listen to me, the reason she came over was to prove to me, now she didn't say any of this, okay, but I'm not stupid and God shows you things if you're paying attention. And she came over to show me that she was just fine drinking wine and she could come into my house and I wouldn't know the difference. And I didn't say a thing to her, but I'm going to tell you what, her words were slurring and she was sounding funny and I knew there was a difference. And I, I, I marked the day that she came over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people think they have to prove a point. And I was a young, I was a very young pastor then. So, you know, I was, they had to challenge me. Anyway, she left. I didn't say anything to her. You know, I really didn't, because I didn't have any proof. But I just knew I could tell. By the way, God told us as Christians to abstain from all appearance of evil. The Bible commands the believer not to give offense in anything. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, 
even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Think about it. Let me ask you a question, though. How profitable is it to your brother if you're a Christian that's drinking booze? Say, so, well, I can control myself. So your brother comes over and he knows you drink, so he drinks and he gets drunk. By the way, you're drunk too and you don't know it, but you are. How profitable is that to, a, to, the, to Christ? Habakkuk 2.15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, right? That puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Well, that's the pattern. That's the direction that it goes. That's it. Booze and taking your clothes off go hand in hand, pretty much. They're just a part of it. Fortunately. That's what happens in this world. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, how about the first drunk in the Bible? Who was that? Noah. What happened? Somebody was naked. Somebody was drunk, somebody was naked, and somebody saw it. Not a good pattern to follow. God pronounces his woe. I'm not going to give anyone anything that will lead them to sin, folks. I'm not going to do that. Now, let's look, number two, the effects of liquor on the mind and the body. Proverbs 23, 29, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? Verse number 33, this is one of the effects of it. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. The Bible gives a perfect description of alcohol in Proverbs 23. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? It says, they that seek mixed wine, look not thou upon it when it is red. You're not supposed to look at it. Why would you drink it? If you're not supposed to look at it, why would you drink it? Look, this isn't hard. This isn't hard to understand. And it's not hard to understand once we see the effects of it, what it does to people. It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder, like we talked about. Do you know what a serpent's bite is? It's poison. Serpent's bite is poison. So what's the Bible saying about liquor drinking? It's poison. Every... Every major organ in your body is poisoned by alcohol, according to the Birmingham News. Scientific data shows alcohol the most physically deteriorating drug there is. It causes more organic damage than any other drug. Why is it that when people get drunk, they have a tendency to vomit? Because your stomach knows poison when it comes down. No wonder the bartender says, name your poison says Terry Watkins. When a, man, when a man is drunk, he is intoxicated. Do you know what, a to what toxic is? It is poison. It's what it means to be intoxicated. It's poison. It's toxic to your body. A drunk man is a man who has literally poisoned himself. Scientists have only recently discovered the physical process that creates the slurred speech and drunken stupor. Once in the bloodstream, alcohol causes a coagulation of the red corpuscles, referred to as sludging. The blood thickens so that it cannot flow freely and clogs the metabolic exchange of life-giving oxygen. And when cells are deprived of oxygen, they die. And because brain cells require a high oxygen supply continuously, they are particularly vulnerable. And brain cells are the only cells that do not reproduce. Is that true, Brother Nate? What's that? Have you studied that before and seen that, that they don't reproduce? Because I've heard that's true, too. I've heard that, that, that a lot, once you damage the brain, that is something that does not come back. It, once you damage those brain cells, they don't come back like they don't. You don't get those over again. You can help what you have left work better, but you can't reproduce brain that brain cells again like that. Doesn't work that way once you kill them. It's different. Judy, you've had a lot of accidents like that and and, and concussions and things. Yep. 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 
right, right, right. They lost their, right, and they're gone. They, they don't get that back. It doesn't come back. Brain cells destroyed or never replaced. Autopsies performed on drinkers often reveal hollow cavities in the skull where entire convolutions of the brain have disappeared. And according to studies by Dr. Melvin Kinsley, brain damage occurs progressively from the very first drunk. The next time you see that man staggering drunk, you are watching a man literally destroying his brain. Alcohol interferes with the brain communication pathways and can affect the way the brain looks and works. These disruptions can change mood and behavior and make it harder to think clearly and move with coordination. These are the effects that it has. Now we're wondering, well, what's this have to do with suicide? Don't worry, we're getting there. But this is what it does to somebody normally that's not even wanting to die, okay? But they're killing their own selves. It's suicide. I would venture to say that just drinking booze is you, you, you're, you're killing yourself, obviously, from what this says. Slow death. Cardiomyopathy. Stretching and drooping a heart muscle. Irregular heartbeat comes from drinking. Strokes, high blood pressure, a fatty liver, alcoholic hepatitis, fibrosis, cirrhosis. Drinking too much can weaken your immune system, making your body a much easier target for disease. Chronic drinkers are more liable to contract diseases like pneumonia and tuberculosis than people who do not drink too much. Drinking a lot on a single occasion slows your body's ability to ward off infections even up to 24 hours after getting drunk. It's destroying your body. You're poisoning it. Alcohol consumption causes physical and emotional changes that can go, that can do great harm to your body. The long-term effects of alcohol abuse are many, putting your health in serious jeopardy and endangering your life. That's at healthline.com. You can see that article. Excessive alcohol use can cause the pancreas to produce toxic substances that interfere with proper functioning. The resulting is inflammation. It's called pancreatitis a serious problem that can destroy the pancreas. One of the most frequent causes of chronic pancreatitis is alcoholic abuse. It's just killing, you're killing your body. You're destroying it. For what? So you can feel a certain way, so you can feel good? Listen, friend, you get saved, you'll feel good. Amen. You get saved, you'll have something to be happy about. You'll have some joy in your life and your heart. You get right with God. Some, some Christians out there that are drinking booze, they get right with God. They, they'll, love, they'll, love, they'll, have, they'll have a lot of joy in their heart and life. One of the first signs of alcohol in your system is a change in behavior. Well, the Bible talks about that. Alcohol travels through the body easily. It can quickly reach many parts of your body, including your brain and other parts of your central nervous system. That can make it harder to talk, causing slurred speech, the telltale sign that someone who has had too much to drink it can also affect coordination, interfere with balance and ability to walk. Drink too much and your ability to think clearly is in trouble, as are your impulse control and ability to form memories. Over the long term, drinking can actually shrink the frontal lobes of your brain. Yeah. Acute alcoholic withdrawal can lead to seizures and delirium, and severe alcoholism can progress to permanent brain damage causing dementia. You ever seen people that are nursing and they have dementia? A lot of them are probably drinkers. A lot of them drank booze their whole life, got drunk. Folks, you can't defy God and his word and expect that nothing will happen from it. You cannot do that. Damage to your nervous system can result in pain, numbness, or abnormal sensations in your feet and hands. Alcoholism can cause a thiamine deficiency which can result in involuntary rapid eye movements, weakness, or paralysis of the eye muscles. Drinking booze and poisons of the heart muscle cells. Yep. By the way, it's a common cause of stroke, heart attack, heart failure, and other things. So I never, I don't, it's not that bad, is it? It's not that big. Go ahead and drink. It's no big deal. Yeah, God said it was a big deal. He said don't even look at it. Now, how does liquor... Liquor and suicide go together. I'm going to give you some statistics here. Help you to understand that. It is well established that alcoholics have a very high suicide rate. Now, why is that, you think? 
Well, if you understand that, that someone that is on liquor, that is drinking booze all the time, and they're already depressed, or they have sorrow in their heart, it's going to make them worse. They're going to get worse from it. It is well established that alcoholics have a very high suicide rate. The evidence is of two kinds. A, follow-up studies of alcoholics consistently reveal high suicide rates. The proportion dying by suicide varies from 8% to 21%, depending on the length of the follow-up in certain areas in the country. These figures represent the risk of 5,080 times that of the general population. Do you realize that? 5,080 times greater chance of committing suicide than the normal population of America. Why? Because alcohol is a killer. Alcohol will help you die if you want to die. You can drink yourself dead easy. It removes all the warnings. All the inhibitions are gone. There's nothing stopping you. There's nothing inhibiting you. There's nothing stopping you from doing what your heart desires to do because the heart is deceitful above all things that desperately wicked. And you add a little liquor in, a little depression in, a little other things in, and you're, you're a classic case for suicide. Suicides consistently find that a high proportion... Uh, retrospective studies of suicide consistently find that a high proportion, varying from 15% in southern England, 1974 to 27% in Seattle, were alcoholics. The evidence of these retrospective studies is that suicide usually occurs, occurs at a late stage in the alcoholic career and is associated with things which are high-risk factors for suicide in other settings. What's that? Let a trauma come into your life. Divorce history of previous suicide attempts and other things, increasing age. I, I, I'm, I'm shocked and I didn't realize this, how many older people commit suicide. I, I didn't know that. As I've studied this, older people, elderly people committing suicide, I had no idea that that was so great. I didn't know it was such an epidemic with older people like that. But it is. It is, and I, I was shocked by it. The origins of the close relationship between alcoholism and suicide have rarely been investigated, though the relationship is readily comprehended. Nobody denies it. Nobody denies that those that commit suicide, chances are they were drinking booze. Number, several elements probably contribute. Number one, alcohol dependency often leads to social decline or breakup of marriage. I've seen people drink their marriage away destroy their marriage by booze. Just absolutely destroy their marriage with booze. Why? Because they love that and they didn't love their family. And they watch their family starve and they beat their children, they beat their wives. And you're going to be some stupid preacher out there telling me it's okay for people to drink? Get away from me! I don't want to be around you! You're nasty! There's something wrong with you! You know, I'm going to tell you something. There's this young man out there, and he's pushing this right now. And I'm going to tell you something about this young man. He ain't never been nowhere in his life. He was in a fundamentalist church, and he grew up in a little fundy bubble, and he thinks the world is like that. And what he doesn't get is there's wickedness that abounds out there. There are rotten, wicked, disgusting people out there that do the most awful things. And all they need is somebody like you to come along to tell them it's okay to suck on a bottle. That's all they need. This man got upset with me and separated from me. I say, good. Amen. I don't want to be around you. You need to repent, you sorry sap. Right. You need to get right with God. Amen. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't seen what booze do to people and how it affects people. You haven't seen what that does to people's lives. I've seen it. I've seen it kill people. I've got family members dead because of it. I've got an uncle that I never met dead because of it. I've got a grandma that died that was driving with her sister that she hadn't seen in years. And she was driving on a back country road. And some drunk came down the road going 85 miles an hour or 75 miles an hour down that road and blindsided her and just obliterated that vehicle, just destroyed it, demolished that vehicle. She flew, one of them flew out the vehicle. They were dead instantly. Not a chance. 
Not a chance. But you know what? If you don't pick it up and you don't drink it, it can never happen. It's not that hard to understand, is it? I'm going to tell you what. There's some Baptists out there that are more libertarian than they are Christian. They need to get right with God, too. God put these in here for a reason, okay? And don't let your political standpoint and your American liberty trump this Word of God. Because it's going to get you in a lot of trouble. And that's what some people want to do today. Anyway, so alcohol dependency often leads to social decline, break of a marriage, loss of job and family ties, and the resulting social isolation is a potent, a potent cause of suicide. You better believe it is. You get somebody on liquor and they're drinking and they drink their sorrows away, they go off by themselves and kill themselves. And they keep away from other people, they don't want to be around anybody, and they drink themselves dead. Or they drink themselves to a point to where it's easy for them to pull the trigger and kill themselves. Or it's easy for them to, to uh, you know, snuff themselves out or whatever they're going to do. Because it always looks worse when you add liquor to it. Whatever the situation is, it always looks worse when you add liquor to it. Alcohol dependency leads to a loss of self-esteem and hence the depression and these psychological changes predispose to suicide. I mean, self-worth, in other words, there's no... I mean, we're not talking about Christian people mostly. We're talking about lost people, obviously. And we're talking about people that, that their self-worth goes down to absolutely nothing because they're drinking booze and, and it just feeds into their depression and devils just jump on that. I wish people actually believed God's word. I wish they actually believed that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I wish they actually believed that, because then they would understand when that, when that liquor puts your, your mind into a different, a different place, it's on a plane where devils roam. That's where it puts you, into a place where devils roam. You say, how is liquor any different than... Uh, than smoking dope or, 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 or taking acid. No, it's the same. It puts you on the same level. It's the same high. Why? Because your mind is emptied and you're working on a different plane. A plane where devils roam. Foolishness. Intoxication produces increased impulsiveness. Hear that? You've seen that before, haven't you? People, their they're impulse, they're just like, man, you can get them. They, you go into a bar and you get a guy drunk, and what do he buy for everybody sometimes? Now, he wouldn't do that if he was sober. He wouldn't buy that whole bar of drinks. He'd be broke. Well, he is broke. He leaves there broke. Why? Because impulsive. Impulsive! How about another one? Not just impulsive, impulsiveness, and a weakening of normal restraints against dangerous behavior. Right? It's like a guy that takes on the whole bar, right, Brother Aaron? Right? Wants to fight the whole bar. Right? What happens? You get destroyed. Right? You think about that, because that's what happens. You get awful brave and awful stupid, and you got a death wish. Because you got no restraints anymore. There's nothing holding back that normal restraint of your behavior. That's why you see men that run around, they drink booze, and they cheat on their wives and everything else. For the most part, those men would never do that. But you get them in the wrong place at the wrong time on booze and by their self in a place where they shouldn't be, and they will do things. Their heart will utter perverse things. And their eyes will behold strange women. Mm-hmm. Somebody would say, well, that person's not normally like that. Of course they're not. They're drunk. They're taking over. they got another spirit taking them over. So they don't have the control that they would have and the restraint that they would have. So now couple that with alcohol. 
mixed with that, I mean, mixed, mixed with depression and suicide, and alcohol is involved in over a quarter of all suicides in the United States, approximately somewhere around 7,500 per year. Directly related, by the way. Not to say the others weren't drinking. Suicide is 120 times more prevalent among adult alcoholics than in the general population. You see that? 120 times. Alcohol abusers have higher rates of both attempted and completed suicide than non-abusers. More than one-third of suicide victims use alcohol just prior to death. How is alcohol use related to suicidal risk? Alcohol increases impulsivity and decreases inhibition. It increases negative self-image and decreases self-esteem, deepens depression and social isolation. You get them on the booze, like I said, they'll get off by themselves or they'll do something crazy. Why? Because they don't have anything holding them back anymore. That God-given conscience that they've had, they've drank that away. So they don't have it. and rises with the amount and length of time alcohol is consumed. Alcohol use fosters either or and all or nothing thinking. That's what happens. It's either it's all or nothing, baby. That's the way it is. That's what it's going to be. We're going to go for it all the way or we're not going to go at all, right? And they get crazy. Why do you think people die drinking booze and get all of it? Because they're slamming them down. They don't have any, they, nothing's holding them back, right? Yeah, 12-gauge shotgun stuck in their mouth, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's what you did? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See? You see what that is, though? Yeah, you see what liquor does, though? Alcohol use fosters either and or an all or nothing thinking and a lower concern for the future consequences of one's actions. Boy, that's for sure. You just, get, you just illustrated that really well, Brother Paul, what you just said. Oh, I'm sure. Many suicide attempts occur during binge drinking. Proverbs 23 again, verse number 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. Among those who are alcohol, alcoholics or drunks, you could say, 18% complete suicide. 18% complete it. Alcohol plays a major role in suicides among elders and veterans. In suicides associated with alcohol misuse, alcohol misuse or drunks, men account for 80% of the victims, women for 20. Alcohol use is also often a factor in suicidal behavior among male teens. Personal loss, divorce, separation, death, legal, criminal, justice problems, job problems, unemployment, financial loss, Early onset of drinking, history of abuse, trauma, violence, pain, family history of alcoholism. All of those things are, uh, uh, contribute to suicidal attacks and or suicidal tendencies. What about co-occurring co disorder, disorders? Co-occurring alcohol abuse and mental illness significantly increase risks. Those who misuse alcohol, street or prescription drugs have a 40 times greater risk of suicide. 40 times. Co-occurrence opens an individual's exposure to more suicide risk factors, weakens family support, and lessens the likelihood of help and intervention. You'd be surprised how many people drink themselves to death, folks, and nobody even knows it. See... It's not that easy, even when you're feeling depressed, to put a gun to your head, to turn on a car, and 
smoke yourself out or something like that or, or the various ways or hang yourself or anything like that. It's not too easy to do that even with depression, even with devils floating around, even those. But you add alcohol into it and it makes it a little easier. Makes it a lot easier. Why? Because you're you're able to you don't you don't care as much. I mean you you don't you don't fear like you would. Right? Like like Nate was saying beer muscles. You don't fear. Right? You're not scared. So you go ahead, it's easy for you to hang yourself. It's easy for you to kill yourself. Many, many drunks make frequent suicide threats, but often vague plans and low intent to die. But this behavior is commonly coincident with demands for immediate shelter, hospitalization, detox, rehab. Aaron, you've probably been around a lot of those people who said they're going to kill themselves so they can get a place to stay or something like that. You know, just so they can get a place to stay. It's often regards, it's often manipulation a lot of times. That's true. There's some of that too, where they're just manipulating. But a lot of people, but like cops and, you know, doctors, they won't take a chance with that because they can't. If you tell them you're going to kill yourself, they, they're going to admit you for the most part because they're not going to, they, because they can get sued for that if they, if they don't. So, so they'll admit you to a hospital. So a lot of times they do that. Someone threatening to hurt or kill herself or himself. Someone looking for ways to take their own life. These are some of those warning signs that you see. Someone talking, writing, or drawing about death, dying, or suicide. When you see people doing that or you see people drawn about death and the most dark and wicked things, there's something going on in that person's mind. You add liquor to that, it's getting real bad. It's getting real serious. By the way, other signs may include giving away personal items, trying to put personal affairs in order, making unexpected calls, visits to relatives or friends, and reference to a doable plan for committing suicide. Lots of folks are drunk when they do that. Alcohol has been found to lower serotonin. Food or mood, it was called. Natural medicine chest, how to conquer depression, things like that. They wrote in a magazine. Alcohol is a depressant. That's what people don't understand. Alcohol doesn't make you feel good. It depresses you. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? A lot of people think, well, it's going to make me feel good if I get drunk. Well, it'll give you a buzz for a while, but is it going to make you feel any better? Because as time goes on, it's going to get worse, and you're going to get more depressed. You're going to get, you're going to get more depressed from that. Because it's a depressant. That's what it does to your body. So does your mind. People with depression shouldn't drink alcohol, says Sherry Rogers, an MD. Well, that's a no-brainer. She says the studies show that doctors misdiagnosing over 66% of the people who are depressed. A lot of them are drunks. Wonder why am I depressed? Well, you're probably dressed, depressed because you're a drunk. Right? Yeah. That was easy to diagnose, wasn't it? Alcohol temporarily blunts the effects of stress hormones. It typically leaves you feeling worse than ever because it depresses the brain and nervous system. One study looked at the people who consumed one drink a day after three months' abstinence, their scores on standard depression inventories improved. You understand that? So they rated people that were drinking booze, and they took those same people off that for three months, and their depression went straight down. Now, God showed you that in Proverbs. I've been reading that. I've said it to you like ten times tonight. But God already showed you that. He said, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contention? You ever met contentious people when they're drinking, right? Yeah. Yep. The brain, you can control your emotional wellness. This is just an article that somebody said, but, but they say people with a manic depressive disorder should not drink alcohol. Makes sense, right? Even doctors say that, says that. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, right? Although important for all ages and older people, folic acid, so it messes with the folic acid of your body too. Folic acid deficiencies contributes to aging brain processes and increased rise of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. D depression is also common in those who, with folate def deficiency. What happens? These people drink, they get so depressed, they have dementia, some of them just kill themselves. And that's where you have a lot of the older people committing suicide. 
I mean, you don't, the last thing, you ever notice in a, you ever notice in movies and all over the place, the first thing you do when somebody's depressed, hey, you, can, I, can I get you a drink? The guy stumbles into the bar and he's depressed because he lost his job. And what does some bartender do? Give him booze. Now, what's the message that sent you? The message that has sent us over and over and over again is that alcohol will help you with your depression. Isn't it? Look at every time you see that on television, on, on, on movies, in books, and everything. You see that. Give them alcohol. No, they don't feel, oh, let's go party. That'll make you feel better. Let's just go get drunk and party. That, no, it won't. It causes you to get, be more depressed. End up killing yourself. Why won't people just believe what the Bible says? It's very simple. Why won't they just believe what God's Word says? The presence of alcohol hastens the breakdown of antioxidants in the blood, speeding their elimination from the body. The acute depress depressant effects of alcohol increases with BAC and has been measured in terms of effects on human performance. Alcohol affects people, says the U U.S. Department of Transportation. Well, we know that. Depression and alcohol problems often go together, but the evidence suggests that in men, alcohol use preceded the depression. Listen to this. Whereas in women, the depression precedes the alcohol use. Interesting, isn't it? Study links alcohol and depression. The reason I'm, I'm talking, we're going to talk about depression sometime, but the reason I'm talking about depression is because you add alcohol with depression, with bad music and demonic thoughts and everything else, and, and you have a recipe for suicide. You have that lethal cocktail. You have that where people are going to take their life. And we're seeing it. We've seen it. For instance, 40% of heavy drinkers suffer from the symptoms commonly attributed to depression. Even with people who drink very little, the figures are still 5% for men and 10% for women. This means there is still a danger that alcohol, even in small quantities, may be harmful. Of course it's harmful. One Canadian study found that 32% of depressed patients were dependent on alcohol, while only 9% of those were not depressed. Were not depressed, were dependent on alcohol. This shows how easy it is to become dependent on alcohol if you feel depressed. So you want to talk about wanting to die. You take somebody that has woe and sorrow already, and then you give them a bottle. Then you give them access to booze, and you get them drinking all the time. They're going to off themselves. That's why, we, that's why so, many of that is, so much of that is connected. That's why it's connected with drug abuse and everything else. A data brief from the National Violent Death Reporting System. I didn't know they had such a place, but they actually do. They have a National Violent Death Reporting System. Alcohol and drug abuse are second only to depression and other mood disorders as the most frequent risk factors for suicidal behavior. Alcohol and some drugs can result in a loss of inhibition, may increase impulsive behavior, can lead to changes in the brain that result in depression over time, and can be disrupted to relationships, obviously, resulting in alienation and a loss of social connection. Furthermore, excessive acute drug and or alcohol ingestion could result in death. By the way, in 2007, alcohol was a factor in approximately one-third of the reported suicides, and 62% of these descendants had a blood alcohol content of 0.08 at the time of death. Less than 0.08. It's not very much, is it? You tell me people just were on a little bit of liquor and they killed themselves? Just a little bit? Yeah, because all it takes... When the devil is working on you, and devils are working on you, and you're depressed already, all it takes is just a little bit of removal of anything that God has placed inside of you to preserve your life. All it takes is just a little bit of that to numb that conscience just enough that you'll take your own life. That's why liquor is dangerous, folks. shouldn't be drank. God's people should not be drinking booze. These people are flirting around with the things that I got saved from. I got saved out of that, and they're playing with it. They're playing with the snake I got saved from. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. One of the most serious consequences of depression is suicide. And this is really the result of a total loss of hope. Suicide is so unnatural that it shows the power of your own, you know, your thinking, your mind. You start thinking about things. 
and alcohol can lead to suicide because it, make, it can make depression worse and confuse your judgment and decision-making ability. What does the Bible say? Your heart's uttering perverse things. You're beholding strange women. You're not even the same. You're babbling. You're not talking. Why? Because you're not even thinking like yourself. You ever met people that drink, that got dr that you knew sober and they were the nicest people? When they got drunk, man, they were the meanest drunks in the world. I mean, you couldn't even be around them. They had a rabid, they had just a, a rabid speech about them. They were angry all the time. Is that you, Brother Paul? And you, what's that? One guy would bite you when he was drunk, Paul said. Oh, that's not good. Hope somebody got a rabies shot. Anyway. It messes up your decision-making ability. It's easy to commit suicide like that. It's easier to end your life. In truth, there's always hope, but alcohol encourages a risk-taking. Risk-taking removes your inhibitions. We've already talked about that. Now you mix the demonic side of suicide and depression. You mix those all together. You mix that spirit world that hates, hates people, that thrives on death. What does the Bible say about, about that? All them that hate me love death. Well, do devils hate God? Yes, they do. Does Satan hate God? Yes, he does. So then what does he love? He loves death. So what does he promote? Death. Booze. Why? Because it's a lethal liquid. And it leads to death. It leads to, it leads to suicide. I'll give you a few statistics. We'll be almost done here. From 2005 to 2007, there were a total of 26,902 suicides. In, in where these where these studies were done in these states poisoning was the third leading method of suicide following firearm and hanging and strangulation 75 percent of suicides by poisoning were due to alcohol and or drug overdose versus other types of poison such as carbon monoxide 75 percent of them from liquor drinking and booze and drugs well, I'll tell you what, the first and easiest drug that people get to is booze, and that's usually what they do first. Before they ever smoke a joint or anything else, usually they'll find a bottle somewhere. And you know, all these, all these industries talk about, well, marijuana, pot, that's a gateway drug. Well, I don't have any problem with that. It is, but alcohol is a bigger one. Alcohol is the acceptable one. Alcohol is the one that is glamorized by sports figures, glamorized by the movies, glamorized by Hollywood. Even your politicians. I got in trouble one time because I told a lot of you that somebody got mad at me because I said, listen, they're a bunch of drunks, what they are. They're just a bunch of drunks. And they said, well, you know, I know some good people up there, really? Because how I happen to know that all their liquor is paid for and it's all up there? You can go look at the congressional record. You can go find it. They got rooms up there in Congress, and all their liquor, as much as they want, is paid for right there. Now, it doesn't make you wonder why it's so easy for them to pass the bills they do with no conscience the way they do it. Well, they're, half of them are drunk and drug addicts. That's why they don't show up to work. That's right. It's not that hard to understand, is it? Less than half, 47% of all those who died by alcohol and or drug overdose were known to have an alcohol or substance abuse problem. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Less than 47% of those that died from that were not known to be regular drinkers. That means they just, they felt like they were in the mood for it. They took the bottle and they took their life. Do you understand that? That's what that means. It wasn't a constant thing that they did all the time. It wasn't a pattern in their life. It just took one, didn't it? Then you got those pretty, oh, you can casual drink, it's okay. Yeah, John Piper and those other men and uh, Mark Driscoll and all those other, putting bars in their, in their churches. How would you like that to go show up to church and, and there's a brewery in there? What a bunch of devils. No wonder why the guy's a sexual pervert and talks about all kinds of perverted things from the pulpit and got removed from there because he was, he was a thief too and stole everybody's writings and everything else. A nasty, perverted drunk is all he was. Poisoning is a leading method in suicide deaths and drugs and alcohol. They make up about 75% of suicide deaths. 
Females die in disproportionate numbers from suicide due to alcohol and or drug overdose. From 2005 to 2007, 34% of female suicides were due to alcohol. You understand that, ladies? 34% of the people that died of suicide due to alcohol. Forty and 64 died from alcohol and or drug overdose. This equal more than four times the percentage of those aged 17 and younger in the same category of versus male and female. Listen, folks, if you know someone who is depressed, a family member or somebody like that that's depressed, and they're drinking booze, you got to get them off the booze as quick as you can. Because it's a, le it's a lethal liquid. It'll, it, they'll kill themselves. If they're in depression and they're, and they're, and they're talking about depressive things and, they're, and they have no joy in their life, you better get them off booze because they'll take their own life. Because all that drinking does is continue them down a road of destruction where they'll take their own life. They'll be so depressed, they'll take it because it'll be easy for them. People who commit suicide while intoxicated are much more likely than those who are sober to kill themselves by violent means, such as using firearms or falling or hanging themselves. Fox News reports. Their numbers, what they looked at, they said, hey, you get them on booze, man, they'll blow their head off easier. They'll hang themselves. They'll strangle themselves. They'll violently kill themselves. Why is that? Why would you be able to violently kill yourself on liquor? Because nothing's restraining you. Nothing's restraining you, so it's easy to do. Folks, I wish people would understand how much alcohol loosens you up and how quickly it does. It's so dangerous. It destroy your whole life. By the way, I'll make it known, you cannot be a member of Old Pass Baptist Church and drink booze here. I don't care what you call casual. There ain't no such thing as casual. You're drunk, you're drunk. That's the way it goes. You just can't. That's right. That's right, they are from God. When you drowned all those things out by drinking booze and you get devils in your head roaming around and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, drinking those booze, you're going to do anything. Your heart will utter perverse things. You're capable of anything. The researchers analyzed the blood alcohol levels of almost 58,000 people who committed suicide. They found that 22% overall were drunk when they died. 24% of men and 17% of women. You understand that? That's just in 58,000 people polled. 22%. And America sells more booze probably than anybody in the world. Look at, all their, look at all the sporting events. That's why I can't figure out why God's people want to go around. We don't need to be around those sporting events. If all they are is a bunch of drunks running around and they're drinking booze everywhere, why would you and I want to be around those people? Why would we want to support those people and, and go about and, and be around them? I mean, why do we want to? These sport, Listen, I'm telling you, all of them are going to go gay. All of them are. All of them are going to be promoting that. They're all going to promote it big time, though. They're going to push it in your face. That's what they're going to do. And, then they're going to, and, and they're already pushing booze in everybody's face. That's all, all they do. It's all, that's all sports, sporting events are about is booze. That's all they're about. That's it. That's what's important, right? Drinking booze. You go there, what are they selling? I used to know a guy that used to do that at all those events, and he sold. They made, he made a lot of money doing that. Right. And they get drunk in their mouth, and they utter perverse things. Right? Anyway, they said this was the largest to date in the, in the U.S. study that looked at blood alcohol levels at the time of death in that 58,000 that they grabbed, said Dr. Mark Kaplan of the Portland State University. He said, most studies in the past have focused on the risk of suicide among people with chronic alcohol problems like alcoholism or alcohol dependence. Our hypothesis is this, where individuals responding to major life stressors or crises who engaged in drinking with a firearm present within a few hours of taking their lives and became disinhibited by the alcohol. They were drinking excessively in order to make it possible to die by suicide. But then you take the other, you take the other study there that says that 47% of those people, they were just casual drinkers. Folks, alcohol is dangerous and it leads to suicide. 
You can't separate the facts of the two. God's word is true. What he said was true about it. He said not to look at it. He said not to touch it. He said not to be around it. Not to drink it. Not to give your neighbor drink. Not to go with the public, the drunks and the drug addicts and the fornicators. Stay away from those people. You know, there's fast that come a time in this nation that you and I are going to have to be away from a lot of people. We're not, we can't go, we're, we're at that point now where we just can't go a lot of places they go and do a lot of things they do. Why? Because there's sin everywhere. And I don't want to sit next to somebody that's, that's drunk around my children, that's slurring their words and talking perverted and doing everything else and stand around all these drunk people. Just look at them when they come outside of those Twins games. Look how drunk they are when they talk to you. You've talked to them before. You know what they're like. Any one of those people can be depressed. Any one of those people commit suicide. Any one of them. Why? Because the Bible's clear. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. He said at last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It's lethal. And you should do all you can to always discourage anybody from drinking. And if you know that someone is depressed... You need to get them off the booze. If they're drinking, chances are they're probably drinking. Most people you see, when they lose a wife or lose a girlfriend or lose something that happens, what are they doing? You find them drinking, right? And they're trying to drink their sorrows away. But all they're going to do is drink themselves to death. And that's what happens. Because they feel like there's no hope for them. Like somebody left them and there was no hope for them, so they're just going to drink. And they're going to drink. And then they end up killing themselves and dying. They end up committing suicide. And it's so common. It's, it's becoming more and more common every day, folks. We've got to be alert. We've got to look for things like that. You've got to look for the signs of things like that in people that are around you. You might work with people that are like that. And if you, if you sense that all they're in that and they, they start talking like that and they don't want to be around anybody, you don't see them show up and you see them uh, separating themselves and people that are around you, they're not normal, you better talk to somebody, you better tell somebody, you better warn them. Something's not right with this person. Could be a family member. You could have family members right now that are doing the same thing. They're separating, isolating themselves from everybody. They don't want to be around anybody, and they're drinking booze. That's, a, that's, that's lethal. Because all they need is the right whispers from devils, and they're, they're going to do themselves in. Because it just it, it puts down all the barriers. It's easy to do. You better believe the Bible, folks. You better believe the Bible, number one, about liquor. I don't care if you're depressed or not. It's dangerous. And God does not want you to drink it. God does not want you to. In fact, he, he told us not to. Amen? He, said, he pronounced a woe upon it. It's not for kings. That's right. It's not for us. You better recognize that. Remember that. God's word is true. And what you sow, you reap. And the Bible is very clear what you will reap from drinking that, and what somebody that's depressed will reap, and you add, like we're going to talk about sometime soon, depression. What is depression? What really is it? We're going to look at what is depression? What is it really? What does that mean to be depressed? And what causes depression? What happens with it? What are the cures for it? And why does depression lead to suicide? Not just the physical things, but the spiritual things. Because I'm telling you folks, there's a spiritual aspect to depression as well. We need to understand that. We need to be able to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you, the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Father, thank you. Lord, I pray it'll help somebody. And Lord, uh, alcohol is dangerous. And God's people, it's not for the kings, Lord. You said that it's not for us to drink wine or strong drink. It's not for us to do that, Lord. You've made us, you've saved us out of that life. Lord, we shouldn't play games with it. It's dangerous. And Lord, I pray these people would understand that they're drinking booze, that it's like a serpent that they're holding in their hand that could poison them at any time and destroy them and kill them and take their life. Dear God, there's so many people that drink themselves into suicide. There's so many that drink themselves to death and they die, and that's suicide too because they've killed themselves. And they know they're doing it. And dear God, I pray that you would speak to hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.